doesn't feel good. We may have an issue. This one right here is really Stop. ugly. It feels like it's seized. This may be one of those that I make a day out of it tomorrow and just work on that. If that breaks, then it's, you know, drilling, threading. Yeah, it's seized in there. Dang it. Well, last night, as you saw in the previous portion of this video, we just about got the water pump off the front of the 12 engine. What caught us short was a problem that has potentially disastrous consequences. And this issue is this bolt right here and this bolt right there. Now, why is that such a big deal, you may ask? Well, let me explain. So, here's the problem. Remember those two bolts? The one right here and the one right here? The issue is that over time, we have two dissimilar metals here, steel and aluminum, that don't get along. There's a galvanic reaction that occurs between the two, and uh, that electrolysis type action actually causes a lot of corrosion to build up between the two parts. Now, bolts like this one, this one, and this one, they just only go into the, into the front cover itself. There's not a lot of length there for it to be a real problem, though it can be. The real issue is where you have bolts that run a long distance through a dissimilar metal. This one right here, it goes into the front cover. This one, if we happen to snap this off, this is not gonna be a deal breaker because once we get the water pump off, we can get at that hole and, and drill it and helicoil it and everything's okay. The issue is this one right here. The problem is that this one and this stud right here, and this bolt right here, all three of them go through the water pump, through the front cover, into the block. So you got about three and a half inches of dissimilar metals fighting with each other for 30 years, okay? And you've got the same thing happening on the other side. So what's happened here is that some of these actually came out pretty easily. This bolt right here, piece of cake. We got this one on the other side, not a problem. The other two bolts that correspond to this one on the other side are studs like this where you just had to spin the nuts off, not a problem. Water pump will slide right off. Now, what happens if we snap this one off right here? Okay, well, what happens is we then take our engine support, put it across the engine bay, strap it to the engine, loosen the motor mounts, loosen the tops of the shocks, take the calipers off of the brake system, hang those aside, take the exhaust system loose, take the steering loose, swing the front subframe down out of the way, and then we can get at the oil pan. And the oil pan is what we need to take off in order to get this front cover off. But that's only getting to the front cover. Now we've got all that electrolysis there in which all likelihood exists on this side as well that are holding this thing on. We gotta come up with some means of actually pulling this thing off of the front of the engine. I don't wanna do that, okay? So my job today, for however long it takes, is to persuade this bolt up here, and this is going to be my trial case up here for the various means that I'm going to use to, to solve this problem. To just use whatever means I can come up with here to remove that bolt and that bolt through non-destructive means. So I can eliminate all that other hassle, which would essentially ruin my life for the next week. 
I don't have that kind of time and I'm too old for that kind of stuff. So we're going to take our time, we're going to approach this with the Zen master's uh, attitude that that bolt wants to come out. We just need to cooperate in the process. I got good news and I got bad news. Bad news first. I just burned up about 30 bucks worth of settling. The good news, I got the bolts out. Now let me tell you how I did that. The anatomy of a thermal extraction. Well, what we have here is the water pump, the front cover, and the block. This bolt, and you can see that it's pretty jammed up with dirt and uh, other corrosion. This fits through this hole. I'm not going to jam it in all the way, but it gets, it goes through the pump, through the front cover, and into the block, as you can see right here. Okay, the issue being that, again, the electrolysis had generated enough corrosion where, where this thing was, uh, was not moving. And you can see at this end right here where the corrosion is. And that's what was holding it. So what I did is, first of all, I took a pneumatic hammer, banged on the head of the bolt, and noted that there was a little bit of movement between the bolt head and the water pump, so I knew that was free. I then took a, uh, a torch and heated this portion of the water pump. Not a lot of result. This hole right here through the front cover. I heated that. A little bit of response, but virtually none. It would, once it cooled down, uh, after about five seconds, it stopped moving. I then went to the threaded portion right here, and that's where I got my best result. I got maybe a tenth of a turn the first time, uh, and it stayed that way probably for 10 heats with the oxyacetylene torch. and. Uh, and then it began to move like a quarter of a turn at a time in between heats. So after 20 plus heats, this thing eventually loosened up and there you have it. So use the rest of the day to take the engine the rest of the way apart, do some cleaning and then tomorrow stick it together. By and large, a pretty darn good day. There we go, boys and girls. The front end of a JAG 5.3 liter V12 ready to accept a brand spanky new water pump. The cleanup, by the way, was a four can job. And here's the water pump. And you can't, you can hardly, well, with one hand, you can just barely turn it. I have no idea how that thing worked without a belt scream and it's just amazing that this thing had any functionality to it at all. But that's behind us now. Time to put this whole mess back together. When you get to this point where you're getting ready to put the engine back together again, in this case we've got the water pump which you see in the middle of the picture there installed and we're getting ready to put belts and air pumps and power steering pumps and that sort of thing back on. Now what you don't want to do at this point is be so focused on getting this thing back together that you don't look around and see if you can find issues that really need to be dealt with which are best dealt with right now and a really good example of that would be that little unit right there. Now what that is is a power steering cooler. Now, if we follow the arrow, we have hydraulic fluid, which is warm from having gone through a pump and a steering rack and so forth. And it's uh, needing to be cooled, goes through this line right here, down through that part. And then this thing, this porcupiney looking thing right here, is just a piece of U-shaped tubing that has coils of wire soldered to it and it goes through here and just like a radiator it passes off heat goes through a short length of steel line at this point then it connects to a piece of uh, oil resistant line which 
attaches to the power steering pump, which lives in this general vicinity right here. How much cooling do you think that thing was doing? And it's not like people haven't been in here before. This water pump has been replaced before. You can see evidence that people have been in this area. This didn't happen just yesterday. This is the sort of thing that takes like 10, 15, 20 years to happen. And uh, it does compromise the longevity of your power steering pump in the rack if you don't take some care and make sure that this stuff is taken care of. So that's what's next. Now, one of the really important things that you need to be concerned about when you are working with these cars, and any car for that matter, is the fuel lines in particular and coolant lines have a certain life to them. And that's all dependent on a lot of things, age, miles, uh, the environment that it's been stored in, and so forth. The thing that you can use in the case of the Jaguar V12 and other Jaguars to help you in that endeavor is to take a look at them and if you see something like that right there on a the line what that is is a little aluminum tag like this one right here on the power steering line that's got a date code on it 15 to 90 okay that's February 15th 1990 in other words, this power steering return line and that fuel line, more importantly, has been on this car when it came on the boat. And that's really important because if that's a fuel line right there that takes about 35 PSI. And that's almost 30 years old. That needs to be replaced, and it will be. So if you see a tag, you need to look at it and see what it is because the probability is it's as old as a car. And it's a ticking time bomb in the case of a fuel line. Getting ready to button up the cooling system renovation on the 1990 XJS convertible. Uh, what I've been doing is, as you can see, replaced all the belts and hoses with new stuff and did a significant amount of cleaning on the front end of the engine and painted a few things like the crossover coolant tube there and we've got a coolant recovery or surge tank over here on this side which also has been painted and uh, had the rust knocked off of it prior to that you'll also notice that there's foam that i've contact cemented to the to the side of the car at this point goes down across the bottom of the car and back up again the other side and the point of this of course is to seal around the radiator so that air has no choice but to go through it and i'm told by a person who is a legendary race car driver engine builder up here in this part of the world that that's good for 10 degrees fahrenheit to the good so I've got about 20 hours in it so far, and a lot of it is devoted to just basically cleaning stuff up and painting and so, oh, and also there's the one hour it took me to remove that bolt there, and the four hours that it took me to remove that one right there. Uh, kind of a nightmare, but you have to take the time, otherwise you break that thing off and the whole bottom end of the engine com comes apart in order to get the front cover off to deal with that issue. So, worked out great. Uh, in addition to this, of course, we have a cooling shroud, a fan shroud here. We've got the main fan. One thing I would say about this is, if you've got yours off and you got it cleaned up, what you need to do is you need to look right here on every one of the fan blades and see that it's not beginning to crack. Because what it's, if it's starting to crack, it's telling you that I'm going to shed one of these blades sometime in the near future. And being cambered as they are like an airplane propeller, they're going to go straight forward through the radiator. So, good idea to deal with that when you got the opportunity. And also, you got the fan clutch, which in this case, there's no play in it. And it resists movement as it should and so forth. 
the electrical fan over here. It's uh, eh, a little wobbly, but I think it'll be fine. Uh, everything else I've got is worse than that one, so on it goes. And I knocked the rust off of the shroud itself and painted it in order to preserve it as much as possible because it was uh, rushing headlong toward a rust out here and there. So uh, if we ever get the engine out, we'll do it upright, but we just needed to do whatever pre preventative measures we could in the interim. So that's ready to go again as well. So there we go. Getting close to dumping coolant in it. And then it's on to doing the same sort of fuel system stuff that we did on the Texas XJS to keep from experiencing the usual engine fire. There you go. Well, we got the 90 Jaguar XJS convertible back together again. We got all those points that we needed to cover that I went through on the checklist in the first episode. Uh, got those all sorted, sorted out. And what we're going to do right now is go through the list and essentially explain how much it costs, roughly the time necessary to do it, and, uh, and see what we've got invested in this car in the end. First of all, the water pump, which was the most problematic of the repairs that we needed to make. As you saw in the last episode, there was some bolts that were a real issue that took us four hours just to, to get those two bolts out. In addition to that, there was another two hours to get down to the point where those bolts were and another couple hours um, in order to put the whole thing back together again. A couple hours cleaning up. We're looking probably at two two and a half full days in order to get all that stuff done. In addition to that, we got an investment of $165.97 in a water pump and a gasket. Uh, we reused the majority of the coolant, so I'm not going to include that in there. And as far as the fuel tank and the leak was concerned, as you saw, we removed the fuel tank and inspected the bottom of it. Found that there was some rust there, but it wasn't that bad. So we cleaned that up put some POR15 on it, and put it back in. That leak that I had mentioned that uh, had happened when I filled the tank up all the way to the top and it leaked intermittently for three days, we found that that was a boot uh, in one of the vent lines that comes down and goes to the front of the car, and there's a point where it reduces from a large vent to a small vent, and there's a little rubber boot in there that is available nowhere. I found that a silicone spark plug boot worked pretty well, and I happen to have one of those on the shelf. I'm going to th give that a value of about $5, including that small amount of POR15 that I used. Fuel lines up in the engine area. We got lucky there. The fuel lines have been replaced just recently between the fuel rail and the fuel injectors. That takes a significant amount of time to do those, so uh, that's time saved and money saved. So all we really needed to do was to replace the rubber portions of the fuel supply and the fuel return lines. And that was $22 worth of line and clamps. Fuel lines in the trunk, we dealt with that when we had the tank out. Uh, we put it back in and that was $12 uh, for, for hose and, and, uh, and clamps. Engine oil change, $43.53 for oil and a filter. Transmission fluid and filter, $28.32. This one right here, fuel pressure regulators. Remember, uh, I felt that the hard starting problem that we had, particularly after it was warm, uh, was related to fuel regulators, and I was correct. I replaced both of them, uh, the one before and the one after the fuel rail, and starts like a champ, regardless of whether it's warm or cold. We got a hose kit. Uh, coolant hoses that I purchased for $75.95, $67.57. Now the air conditioning, I said that that was an issue not only for the comfort of the passengers but also to keep the fuel cool. Well, it's not going to be that warm 
as we drive out to Rapid City, South Dakota. In fact, it's going to be pretty cool and rainy. So we didn't feel that we had the necessity of air conditioning during the trip, mainly because we ran out of time. So uh, it costs us nothing to do the AC. The tires, that was just a simple matter of taking the tires off of the Texas XJS, which were practically more than 50 miles on them and swapped them with the ones on the convertible and vice versa. Tony's got access to a changer as well as a balancer, so that didn't cost us anything to do. Now, if you add all this up, $552.94, you add that to the purchase price of the car, we've got a great running 1990 XJS convertible, which is reasonably presentable for $3,552.94. So, we're ready to take off on the trip. We're gonna leave in about 36 hours and uh, it's going to be a fun time. So if you want to see those road trip videos, be sure you come back and see, uh, see what's going on at the Camp Chaos Chronicles channel. So if you like what you see, like us, share us, and subscribe to us, and we'll see you the next time on the Camp Chaos Chronicles.